I say none of this to be dramatic, but Xu Xu makes dark music. Music that deals very explicitly with topics like suicide and sexual assault. And for those that know the band, this is not something new. But if you are unfamiliar with the band and their music, consider this a warning of sorts. It's impossible to talk about this band and their music without delving into the deepest, darkest crevices of the human experience, and I intend on censoring as little of that as possible. But it's not their explicit nature that makes them worth talking about. It's the whole experience. I realize that this phrase is probably overused at this point, but nothing sounds like Shushu. Jamie Stewart's voice and his chosen register is entirely unique to him, and the blend of electronica, folk and noise makes for a uniquely uneven sound. It all comes together to create songs that often feel tumultuous and, to an extent, tortured. The easiest descriptor to throw onto the band would be a tag like noise pop or art pop, but neither are broad enough to really capture what Sushu does, and while it's tempting to think of Sushu as being excessive, I think they're better defined by how much constraint they show. Shushu knows when to be loud and they know when to be quiet. It's not death metal and there's an unmistakable sincerity to all of it, even in the stranger moments. The band's catalogue is intimidatingly long, but almost every album is unique in some way or the other. I can't guarantee that you'll like every one of them, but I can guarantee that it'll be an interesting journey. As far as thesis statements go, Knife Play is an almost perfect introduction to Shushu. Not just in style, but also philosophy. The band sound will change in subsequent albums, but the core details presented here will always stay the same. Shushu is essentially the brainchild of one Jamie Stewart. They started playing in the local music scene and were published in a few indie music productions. It's interesting reading about the band in their infancy, a lot of what writer David Esperanza said about the band in their early years actually carries through to now. Quote, the Western world may be infatuated with rock bands playing rock instruments alongside synths and drum machines, but Shushu takes it a step further. Fuck the rock guitars and drum sets. Shushu takes indigenous instruments and works them with programmed drum beats. It's not a let's throw all these wacky instruments together and see what happens approach either. Stewart clearly is picky about what kind of tone he's shooting for. Knife Play has a lot of discernible musical qualities to it, but it's all patched together and layered in a way that lends an entirely different feel to the album. The opening track, Don Diasco, illustrates this perfectly. It opens with clanging Chinese theater percussion and warm synth tones. Then Stewart starts singing, and we get these sharp, piercing bursts of feedback and these low-hitting drum machine beats. And through the whole thing, Jamie Stewart sounds frantic. And the rest of the record features more or less the same tonality and the same instrumentation, just in different arrangements. The song is also a great introduction to Stewart's writing as well. The chorus features these fuzzy, comforting washes of synth and distortion, over the top of which Stewart sings about disappointment and suicidal ideation. I'm aware that outside of the context of the music, a lot of this may seem rather melodramatic, and it is to an extent. But once you hear Stewart sing it, it's clear that he means what he is saying. In the piece I quoted earlier, the writer describes Stewart's voice as a cross between Robert Plant and Trent Reznor, and I think that's a pretty accurate description. There's a tenderness to Stewart's singing, a softness that I think shows even through the most frantic moments, which is perfectly demonstrated on the song I Broke Up. Lubra sees the introduction of horn melodies, which were actually arranged by Don Diaz, the guy who the first song is named after, and played by members of a ska act that Stewart knew. The contrast between the tinny percussion and warmer brass tones is brilliant. Stewart pushes into his upper register on the chorus, voicing his desire to help somebody. 
The song is a reference of sorts to a kid Stuart knew when he worked in a record store. The exact details are obviously unclear, but as far as tone and texture goes, this is one of my favourites off of the album. The album can give off an impression of being rather rickety and thrown together, but there's a lot of attention to detail. Despite having been recorded in Jamie Stewart's apartment, there's clearly a lot of effort put into how the record sounds. I mean, for one, just the sheer amount of instrumentation that shows up on the record, a lot of which gets buried in the mix. There's also a notable amount of guest appearances. Don Diaz's baritone sax graces a few songs and Greg Saunier from noise pop act Deerhoof appears in songs like Hives Hives, a song that actually features two drummers playing simultaneously. Dr. Troll, lyrically, features this interesting confluence of situations. The song deals with Jamie Stewart's own struggles with gender dysphoria, as well as allusions to his time as a preschool teacher. The track closes out with multiple references to famous musicians and bands, with the narrator describing their personal struggles. His time as a preschool teacher would actually pay off again in songs like Anne Dong, the name being a reference to one of his former students. The lyrics read like a series of conversations, with the final one feeling particularly sweet and touching. mainly composed of feedback and faraway bells. Stewart's voice sort of floats. There's a dissonance to it that feels very opposite to the lyrics. What follows that is perhaps the darkest and most poignant track on the album, Suha. It starts rather innocently, opening with drum machine beats and fuzzy synth textures. It never really blooms until the chorus. I remember listening to this record for the first time and having to stop what I was doing to pay attention because of the very open and explicit manner in which the song talks about suicide. And when I say open and explicit, I mean open and explicit. The song tells the story of a woman who, to put it plainly, hates everything about her life. The painful part isn't even the narrator's desire for death. It's the pleading nature of the chorus's final lines, when will I be going home? Together with the name Suha, it paints a bleak picture of a woman trapped in a place and situation with no recourse for escape other than death. My words won't do the song justice, but it really is, in my opinion, one of the best things to ever come from the band. It's an incredibly painful song. Which then obviously begs the question, why would anybody subject themselves to listening to painful music in the first place? Why put yourself in a situation to feel things other than love or happiness? I don't think there's any real satisfying answer to that question. But for whatever reason, being exposed to music like Shushu, music and lyrics that are often dark, is somehow fulfilling. Perhaps in the same way that watching tragic romances or horror films is. Popo describes a different life entirely, one of excess and sex under the guidance of a sugar daddy. It's depraved in the softest way possible, with the narrator urging the listener to put out as often as they need to. This song, out of all the others on the record, sounds most like a Nine Inch Nails song. The guitars, the buried vocals, and driving dance rhythms are very reminiscent of Trent Reznor's earlier work. And like Nine Inch Nails, Stewart is for the most part the only stable member of the band. Only two of the members that appear on this record would go on to appear on the next album, one of them being Yvonne Cheng. 
a name that shows up in the song Hermonculus. The song's brittle distortion plays counter to the track's tender lyrics. It's a very open admission of adoration, be that romantic or otherwise. And there's a real sweetness to a lot of what Stewart says. The pitched piano and low harmonium notes seem to pair perfectly well, even with everything swelling as the song enters the chorus. The record closes on a somber note. Much of the dramatic and high energy instrumentation is gone, leaving only an out of tune piano. Tonight and Today isn't one of my favorite songs and I wish the record ended on a higher note, but it doesn't diminish the overall quality of knife play. Few bands sound this distinct this early on. Not just distinct, but decisive. I think noise acts get a bad rap for being lazy or just throwing things together. But it's clear that every word and note on this album were very carefully planned out. Which all comes together to make an album of brittle highs and very deep lows. And it's not just sad music. It's visceral and exciting with layers and atmospheres that refuse to remain in line with what you expect. And while the band's second record may get a lot more attention, it doesn't mean that the debut isn't worth your time, because it most certainly is. I suppose the first thing we should talk about is the album art, which features a homeless Vietnamese man holding a baby doll. The photo was taken by Stewart during a vacation to Vietnam. The uncensored cover, which I obviously can't show you, shows the man completely naked. To some degree, the cover makes sense. I'm sure there's a lot of clever parallels one could draw between the cover's sleaziness and the music on the album. But I think it says a lot more about Xu Xu and, by extension, Jamie Stewart. There's this perceived lack of shame and nakedness to a lot of what Xu Xu does. Which isn't to say that it's without artistic embellishment or exaggeration. But there is an undeniable realness to all of it. A promise goes to a number of these dark places, more often than knife play. But there are brighter, more wholesome moments as well. The album opens with Sad Pony Gorilla Girl, a song about a woman engaged in an extramarital affair with a lesbian. The string melodies feel pensive. Stewart sings in a restrained whisper for the most part, his voice opening up only during the chorus. The sweet sentiments appear alongside more salacious lyrics and grim reminders of the reality of the situation, altogether creating this tragic romance. I don't want to say much about Epistat Commander, it, it's in my opinion the best performance on the album. The track is, to put it lightly, crushing. Where Suha mentions suicide, Epistat Commander seems solely focused on it, with the narrator describing the relief that will come from death. The song feels the way the lyrics read. It's tense right from the start. The chorus brings a very real and very odd sense of climax. It's not the only song to reference or discuss suicide. Blacks is told from the perspective of a father confessing his suicidal thoughts to his son. The album doesn't shy away from discussing these really dark topics. And a lot of them are personal, which only adds to the emotional impact. Stewart throws himself into a lot of these songs, often using his own name or the names of people he knows in his real life. And again, how much of this is embellished we do not know. But I don't get the sense that Stewart is being dishonest. Perhaps the toughest pull to swallow musically, Brooklyn Dodgers is about Stewart's brother moving away at a young age. The lyrics read like a delayed farewell, with Stewart wishing his sibling all the best despite feeling pain. The music is restless, Featuring this uneasy mix of clapping dance beats, sour synth melodies, and Stewart's howling falsetto. It's not the most welcoming atmosphere, but it feels appropriate. 
Walnut House deals with the end of life as well. It sounds more blatantly bleak than Epistat Commander. This time it's focused on growing older, on aging and the disease and sickness that that brings. Stewart mixes literary references with real life experiences of him visiting his grandmother in a nursing home. The song is carried by floaty piano chords and bits of percussion that contribute more to the texture than anything else. And of course, the now familiar theatre percussion returns to bring the song to an uneasy end. While Epistat Commander is by far the best performance on the record, I still have a personal preference for 20,000 deaths. The lyrics aren't as clear as Epistat, but the atmosphere is really the biggest draw. The dance rhythms and ringing synth melodies feel very energetic and propulsive, while Stuart's singing is reduced to a series of mumbles and moans that melt into the rest of the instrumentation. In a way, the song feels almost too subdued to be on a shoo-shoo album, coming across more like abrasive, noisy dream pop, especially when compared to a song like Pink City, which in comparison is made up largely of feedback and distortion. The synth melodies are decipherable, but Stewart is once again buried. He's singing monotone. The persistent percussion also lends a real old-school synth-pop feel to the song. The album ends with a series of references and allusions. The second to last is a cover of Tracy Chapman's Fast Car, while the final track references Ian Curtis from Joy Division. Shushu are somewhat known for their covers. The band has a long history of covering tracks from various artists, be it live or on a record. And for the most part, these covers are always impressive. Their cover of Tracy Chapman's Fast Car, on the other hand, is haunting. Stripped down to a gut string guitar and Jamie Stewart's fragile voice, the song's tragic undertones become more apparent. It wasn't a happy song in the first place, but the original's folk pop approach distracted from the song's sadder elements. Shushu pulled back the chorus as well, adding a sparse series of drum hits that do nothing to elevate the mood. And as is common for a Shushu cover, Stewart makes the song his own, changing two of the verses to better fit his own personal situation. Convenience store becomes Eastside San Jose Child Development Center and prescription drugs take the place of alcohol. Stewart actually talks about the song in an interview, explaining how it influenced Yushu's love of tragic storytelling. With the Tracy Chapman song, that song really very, very, very directly shaped how I wanted to write lyrics, or what I wanted to write songs about, he explained, and how I wanted them to turn out insofar as the song very specifically narrates some particular horrible things that happened to somebody, and there's no positive resolution in the end at all. Mirroring that, the album ends with no resolution as well. The final song, Ian Curtis' Wishlist, features a similarly stripped back presentation. According to Stewart himself, the concept of an Ian Curtis wishlist is a series of things we hope for that we know deep down inside will never ever happen. Essentially a list of things that will eventually end in disappointment. The floating synth string melodies turn violent as the song ends. A thick rumble of triangular synth washes throughout the song's finishing moments, retreating at the end to let the original melody run its course. A Promise was the first Shushu album I heard, and it still stands as one of my favorites, not just in the context of the band's discography, but overall as well. Sadness has never sounded as comfortable as it does on this album. There's something about looking at the album cover while listening to A Promise. It seems to draw everything back into context, back into the real world. There's no corpse paint or black eyeshadow to hide behind. This is a record about how life sucks sometimes. A reminder that there are people out there who spend their lives in shitty conditions. I'm not discounting the dramatic elements, I'm just reminding myself that life isn't always just rosy. I imagine that this record probably sounds different to people in those situations. Maybe it sounds cheap. Or maybe there's a comfort to be found in the record's dark, sardonic lyrics and the fucked up instrumentation. I don't know. It's not for everybody, but for some of us, shit like this means something. Charm, fabulous muscles Cremate me Here's what I'll say about fabulous muscles. If you are new to Shushu, 
this is not the album to start with. There's a certain amount of shoeness you need to ingest before Fabulous Muscles makes any real sense. This album is incredibly temperamental, which you might not guess judging by the album art. It's less abrasive than A Promise, and sparser than both the first two albums. The album art deviates from the first two records. All the titles are written in colourful highlights and Stewart is nuzzling a toy cat. A sort of misdeed. There's a lot more space in the mix and the instruments feel drier than they did previously. The first song opens with sequenced drum beats and clean synth tones, both of which lend a very chiptune-esque sound to the song. A sound that continues into the chorus where Stewart's voice becomes more impassioned. The lyrics see Stewart comparing his mother's time in high school to her life now, a life of black and light black, obviously using colour as a way to denote experience. <laughs> There's a lot more that can be read into the lyrics, but in a sense they feel oddly evocative. The bridge features more overtly negative experiences like breaking fingers and dying by car. It's a song that really grew on me once I started paying attention to the lyrics, and in a way it's the perfect way to open this album. It sees the band exchanging somber synth tones for more energetic upbeat melodies, and that immediacy continues onto I Love the Valley O. Oh. Like the first song, this one is based on a conversation with a family member as well. It's worth stating that the recording of this album overlaps with the tragic passing of Stewart's father, and his death creeps its way into a number of the lyrics on the album. The opening lines of the song are actually direct references to words spoken to Stewart by his father, with the older man trying to convince his son to start taking antidepressants. The hardest hitting lyrics are by far the repeated refrain of It's a little soir de la famille, which translates roughly to the history of the family. Essentially, Stewart acknowledging that the burden of medication abuse rests heavy on both sides of his family. And he describes the dysfunction this causes through images of razor blades and broken French. And while both opening tracks are high energy, Valley feels more anxious. The song is essentially the musical equivalent of clenching teeth. The feeling of things building constantly with little to no resolution. Or as Stewart puts it, there's no rest until he either forgets about it all or he doesn't care. In a lot of ways, the song is devastating. There's the reminder that you're bound to your family in some way or the other. No matter how much you try and separate yourself from it, the feelings will never fade. The same chemistry that makes us love our mothers is the same thing that compels us to love and care for our closest relatives regardless of how fucked the situation is. It's worth acknowledging Jamie Stewart's vocal performance on the song as well. While the music by itself is compelling, Stewart's vocals elevate the song to something special. <laughs> I suppose now would be a good time to address Support Our Troops O, a caustic bit of commentary on war and the soldiers involved therein. Whether or not I agree or disagree with the track's sentiment, my biggest hang up is with the music. The lyrics are flagrant and harsh, but the sparse instrumental makes the song as a whole difficult to digest, which is perhaps the point. Tracks 6 to 9 all deal with abuse. Fabulous Muscles explores the idea of being attracted to people that hurt you. The soft instrumental makes the whole thing feel like some sort of fucked up love song. In contrast, Brian the Vampire's instrumentation is loud and whistling. On a record made up of tragic experiences, the one accounted on Brian the Vampire is by far the most harrowing. To put it plainly, the song is about a boy Jamie Stewart knew from his previous job at the San Jose Child Development Center, who was, on a nightly basis, abused by his older brother while his parents slept in the same room. In the song, he summarizes the whole thing into seven lines but goes into a lot more detail in the commentary for the record. 
which is worth listening to if you want to know more about Brian, a boy who Stewart clearly cared for. The story is a reminder that sometimes fucked up things happen and there's nothing you as a person can do except hope that it gets better. Stewart revisits familial drama on the song Nieces Pieces, where, against a background of horns and harmonium, he ponders about what the life of a girl born into a dysfunctional family will end up being. And none of it is good. The last lines are probably the most tragic. I can't wait till you realize Your mommy's heart is broken I can't wait to watch you grow up Around the people who broke it Clowntown is the catchiest song on the album. It's harder to decipher what the lyrics are about due to how specific they are. But the song itself, a poppy ballad with bleeps and cluttering percussion, is enjoyable and fun to sing along to. As mentioned before, Stewart's father's death is a focus on the record. And the song Mike deals with it more explicitly. The opening lines don't seek to hide much. Dad, what was Nigel supposed to do with your body? A life I will never understand. His false teeth were gently pressed back into your mouth by your daughter's husband. Despite being the longest song on the record, Mike has no chorus or refrains. It's a monologue of familial inside jokes and confessions of love set against a brace of textures. There are ringing synthesizers that carry the melody, but the rest of the song is composed of sharp, clanging bursts of sound, a fitting end to an album of bitterness and grief. There's very little levity to Fabulous Muscles, and it's a hard listen at points, but certainly not something you'd want to skip. La Pore is a very uneven album, mercurial at points, and it never really gets going. There's a general mood that hangs over everything, a lethargy that's only relieved midway through the track list. This isn't to say that it's not good, but it feels avoidant, obtuse, and offers very little hand-holding. And the first track encapsulates this perfectly. It opens with acoustic guitar and singing, with some chimes and strings appearing deeper into the song. The mood is depressed, and the song is difficult to listen to. There's no engagement here, nothing that really sucks me in, which is not true for the second track at all. Muppet Face's steady rhythms and synthetic bell melodies are immediately infectious. In classic shoo-shoo fashion, the chorus is energetic and loud. In the same breath, the song references the death of a cat and Jamie Stewart's shame. And once again, I have no concrete ideas about what the song means. I do appreciate the many religious allusions Jamie uses to describe his shame. Stabbing my hands like a savior being a particularly powerful image. Track 3 brings another dip in energy. The mood sours a lot more. I do like the snares of the metallic percussion that make up the song's backbone though. But the first song that really captivates is Pox. Pox is, in all honesty, one of the most well-composed fuck you songs ever. The bitter lyrics are wrapped up in electronic beats with swirling synths and jangly guitars. The chorus sees Stewart singing. The music video for the song plays on themes of domestic violence, but the lyrics themselves make references to nature and various locations in rural California, suggesting some sort of environmental or conservationist theme. Or perhaps the song is written from the perspective of native Californians battling with European settlers. Either way, it stands as a brutal rebuke. Things dip once more with the song Baby Captain, only for it to take a more dramatic upturn on the song Satin. This time Stewart aims his anger at then president George W. Bush, with Stewart referencing the well-known image of the god Saturn eating his son. The song is unapologetically violent. Stewart himself has said that the song is about, and I quote, wanting to rape President Bush to death. The next highlight on the album for me is the song Ale. It's a slow, patient song that relies on very little to get by. 
just clarinets and a few hits of percussion. That and Stewart's singing. The whispered refrain of shut up, shut up rises in tone as the song progresses, with tension building and finally dissipating at the song's end. The lyrics describe an unpleasant situation. Again, there's hatred aimed at somebody, and as before, the bitterness is covered up by depression. The low mood continues into the next songs as well. Bog People is a song that emanates nihilism to its core. It opens with frantically strum acoustic guitar, muted percussion and off-key keyboard notes. The song is best summed up by the following lines. The rest of the lyrics reference hardships from Stewart's own life, like the passing of his father, with the only mention of anything positive showing up near the end of the song. The chorus is tense, with Stewart seemingly accepting that there's no point to questioning why everything is so bleak, and instead, just begging for it to let up. The song's title, Bog People, refers to dead decomposing bodies found floating in swamps. Interestingly, the song that follows it, Dangerous You Shouldn't Be Here, tells the story of a young girl who drowned and her parents subsequently committing suicide. It's dark in a way that Shushu hasn't been up until then. The droning instrumentation and the mention of witchcraft lends a mystical quality to the whole thing. The most biting portion, fittingly, the most realistic, comes near the end where the narrator describes lacing wire around their neck. The song ends abruptly and flows near perfectly into Yellow Raspberry. The instrumentation drones similarly. The song serves as a meditation on debauchery and the mundane with Stuart questioning, what has changed as you tell you, doll, cross, cactus, hello? In between describing beating off to escort pages and dressing like a bunny. In a general sense, the song acts as a fitting end to a depressing album. La Forêt has been, in my experience, one of the most difficult Shushu albums to listen to, particularly because of the mood. There are high notes like Pox, but the majority of the record is dark and, to an extent, dreary. What I can't say in support of the album though, is that the low notes hit pretty damn low and will definitely force you to contend with some dark truths. The Air Force swings the other way. Whereas the previous record was subtle and understated, the Air Force is immediate and bold even in its quieter moments. The album opens with piano keys, muted and heavy, then percussion, roomy and bright. Stewart then self-deprecates about appearance. The words feel very innocent and youthful, like an overheard conversation between a high schooler and his lover. The production feels less claustrophobic. Each instrument is sequestered and left mostly untouched, another change of pace from the record that preceded it. It serves the album well, making the percussive hits and synth stabs more impactful. The album's innocent nature reveals itself once again on the song Hello from Hugh Clare. This is the first Shushu song with somebody else on lead vocals. Band member Carolee McElroy's voice is soft and precocious. The lyrics seem to be sung from the perspective of a woman wishing to be seen as a strong independent man who can pay their own bills and untuck what needs to be untucked. But the album's first and perhaps biggest highlight is the song Vulture Piano. I'd have no trouble in counting it amongst my top 10 Shushu songs. It's a classic. Quiet verses that launch into rhythmically and harmonically moving choruses. The song is simple and the lyrics, though somewhat vague, clearly deal with sexual assault. The images Stewart recalls are vivid. by God
Whether the person the song addresses is a victim or the perpetrator is difficult to discern, but it's implied that the person being spoken to, the person recording the memory, views the memory with some fondness. Either way, it's an uncomfortable notion nonetheless. The next song sees Stewart moving back and forth between singing and talking over a delicate instrumental. PJ in the Streets is a song that eventually grew on me. There's no explosive chorus and the instrumental stays static throughout most of the song, but at the end of the day, Stewart's singing is what really won me over. The album was produced by Greg Saunier, a man who I've mentioned before. He's the drummer and co-producer for the noise pop act Deerhoof. Shu Shu are no strangers to noise, obviously, but with Saunier handling the production, the noise does seem oddly cleaner. The production is sharper with the stabs of distortion and feedback throughout the record feeling more pointed and impactful. Like the instrumental swell in the song Bishop California, for example. A swell that appears right before one of the most painful lines in the album. The song's resolution, a sequence of sharp angular synth melodies and brittle percussion, feels equally as impressive. The guitars that open the pineapple versus the watermelon feel detached and muffled. The one that follows is almost uncomfortably clean, the naked, unaffected string standing out against the softer, whispery backdrop of voice and percussion. The instrumental sounds like it wouldn't be out of place on some cheaply recorded math rock release. The opening lyrics are striking. Can I pray? The poetic euphemisms fall away at some point and Stewart speaks more plainly. Someone felt something pure and told it all to you. That was why you killed yourself, to prove it wasn't true. Despite dealing with death, the song doesn't feel particularly mournful. The sadness seems to come from disappointment, disappointment that somebody would take their own life. Stewart sums it up more or less with a line deeper into the song. It's obscene why you missed what they saw in you. Save Me, Save Me is one of the more upbeat and dare I say fun instrumentals on the album. The lyrics, however, are amongst the most depraved. In a way, the song is sort of a prophecy fulfilled. Knife Play was released four years before the Air Force, and here we finally have a song that deals with, you guessed it, knife play and sex and blood. Sex and knife play and blood. In an interview with Stereo Gum, Stewart said the following about the song, and I quote, Talking about the song will reveal way too much about my love life. It's particularly about my obsession with sex and this unhealthy feeling that it's what will make me whole. I need it too much. Musically, Save Me is my favorite off the record. The rhythms are delightfully muddled and a little bit unwieldy. Electronic beats meet brittle hand percussion while instruments weave in and out. It's dizzying, all of which adds to the song's message of indulgence and confusion. The lyrics deal as much with regret as they do with sex. It's a definite highlight on the album and amongst the best the band has recorded. Unhealthy relationships seem to be a running theme throughout the last leg of the album. The Fox and the Rabbit is another one of the more intricately composed songs in the album. Stewart's singing sounds particularly dejected. The instrumentation shifts from brooding to energetic in the last leg of the song and eventually settles into something that feels like it would not be out of place at an EDM concert. The song's meaning comes to bear at the end as well. When the fox hears the rabbit cry, he comes running, but not to The words are nearly buried by the music. It's the narrator describing codependency one person exploiting the weakness of another for their own gratification. It's a dark theme that's mirrored in the last song as well, but Wigmaster is more tortured. It's not a song I particularly enjoy, but I am impressed by how dark it feels. The lyrics, written in part by soon-to-be permanent band member Angela Sue, comes across as disparate pieces of depravity that may or may not be coming from the same person with a number of lines it would be too uncomfortable to read aloud. 
To sum it all up, The Air Force is a good album, amongst the best the band has done, and a testament to the fact that Sushi refuses to stay in one space for too long. Women as Lovers presents another jump in fidelity. Everything from the music to the album cover feels sleeker and glossier. The production isn't far off from the Air Force, but things are notably drier. It's a weird dichotomy, with everything feeling both expensively produced and cheaply recorded. The horns that appear all over the record creak and squeal, and the percussion sounds bony, with so little reverberation that it could have been recorded on a cassette. And the same remains true for most of the other instruments. The album definitely stands out in that regard. Like the Air Force, the songs feel like they've been glued together, rickety and held together by Stewart's vocal melodies and the occasional synth line. Stewart more or less carries the opening song on his shoulders, with his voice adding a lot of necessary warmth and color to a sparse and understated instrumental. The horns that appear at the end of the song are piercing for that same reason. But there is something charming about the stilted vocal rhythms. Track 2 is busier but equally as crisp. The hats ring out with a satisfying crash and the whole song sounds very garage rocky. It switches between frantic verses and calmer refrains, in essence classic shoo shoo. The band's use of Asian percussion and feedback date back all the way to the debut, but the presentation on this album is somewhat different. In some ways it makes things sound even more immediate than they have before. If you've ever been in a small venue with the live band blaring away, it's more or less that same sound, naked and unpretentious. In truth, it's part of why I have difficulty with this album. I kinda liked the fuzz on the previous records. Without it, things sound colder. But the songwriting's still there and that's by far the record's most redeeming quality the sing-along melodies and anthemic choruses. No Friends O oh, is a song that seems almost too cheerful for its subject matter. The music itself is immediately reminiscent of 2000s radio rock, Think Panic at the Disco, while the lyrics about an older man and his younger lover are not as foreign to Shushu. The album's most surprising cut is their cover of Queen and David Bowie's Under Pressure, with Stewart and McElroy playing the part of Freddie Mercury while Michael Jira from Swan's fame plays the part of David Bowie. I have to admit, their rendition of the song grew on me over time. All respect to Michael Jira, his voice is not really that well suited to this kind of singing. Still, they managed to pull off a decent, surprisingly traditional cover of a classic song. Things grow darker with the song Black Keyboard. The finger-pick guitars make up most of the instrumentation and are haunting and darkly tinged. Songs describing abuse of a minor are never easy to swallow, and calling one well-written seems odd, but Black Keyboard is exactly that. Told from the perspective of a victim of incest, it captures a lot of twisted, confusing and painful feelings that must permeate that situation. One of the most telling lines uses a bit of lyrical subversion to dictate just that. Hold me, mommy, face down in your film. Continuing in that bare bones direction, track 8 features very little besides voice and guitar. The track's title contains more than one reference, the first being a name of an ex-band member and the other being part of the opening lines of a Smith song. The fragile guitar strums and Jamie Stewart's whisper underpin the themes of sadness and insecurity expressed in the lyrics. You are pregnant, you are dead is the greatest song title ever. Given that Greg Saunier plays in both bands, I find it no surprise that there's some cross-pollination between Deerhoof and Shoo Shoo. Nowhere is it more obvious than on this song. The song doesn't feature Saunier at all, but the playful energy and simple vocal melodies are a dead giveaway for Deerhoof. But obviously all comparisons end at the lyrics, which may or may not be about a dying pregnant woman. Stewart's voice seems pressed up against your ear on the song Puff and Bunny. Amidst faraway bass lines and ringing chimes, Stewart recites words of a lonely person craving attention. It's a song that I wish lasted just a little bit longer. The melody is sweet and the dark tones of the music feel somewhat comforting. White Nerd is another song that grew on me. 
I'm not completely on board with the song's sentiments, however. It's very clear in its attack of upper middle class internet activists. Stewart has never been shy about voicing his beliefs and opinions, be they political or otherwise, and for that reason white nerd is not that surprising. But it's not the easiest pull to swallow. It does help, however, that the song itself is catchy. The album finishes strong, with my favourite track appearing right at the end. McElroy and Stewart's voice overlap at various points throughout this record, but never has the duet felt so poignant. The music swells in the chorus and the pair conjure history with the mention of the year 1948. The synthesizers, at points off-key and disruptive, squeal while they sing, and the record's darkest moment is captured by the words The name doesn't seem to be connected to anybody well known, but it doesn't make it any less touching. The last moments are spent with Stewart's layered whispers and off-key guitars. It's a tragic and beautiful close to the record. I do like women as lovers, perhaps not as much as Shushu's other work, but it's still something I return to often. The title track to this album, Dear God I Hate Myself, is overall a good representation of the band's ethos, self-deprecation, dance beats and upbeat attitudes. An ethos that Stewart elaborates on in a Pitchfork interview, stating, The very first night I ever wrote and recorded a Shoo Shoo song, I'd gone to this terrible dance club in San Jose alone on Christmas night, as pathetic as that is, and I'd come home alone after feeble attempts to pick someone up. Shushu came from feeling stupid and lonely and then wanting to dance it away, but having the club and its music only magnify that stupidity and lonely feeling. Dear God is more straightforward than Women as Lovers, and feels like a throwback to some of the band's earlier work. There's not much obfuscation. This may be a testament to how much Shushu I've heard over the last few months, or it may be a representation of a certain lack of remorsefulness on my side, but I didn't flinch the first time I heard the opening lines to Grey Death. The song has a certain humour to it. Humour that Stewart seems to acknowledge later on. The production is also notably rougher than before, the album sounding gritty and angular at points. Track 2 presents another purposeful mismatch of theme and music. The song sees Stewart making vague references to self-image and eating disorders. In a strange turn, track 3, Apple for a Brain, sees Stewart making references to two fictional characters, the first being Butters from South Park and the second being the panda from Hello Kitty. Of course, there's a dark twisted bend on the whole thing, but that doesn't make the choice of subject matter any less strange. The album's first real highlight for me is the song House Sparrow. The song is tense from the start, the band overlaying synths and voice in a way that feels off-key but still pretty. The tension seems appropriate given the subject matter. The lyrics contain multiple references to serial killer Richard Chase and murder in general. Most of the song seems to be written from the perspective of a survivor, someone being chased and hunted. Richard Chase's predilection for necrophilia and cannibalism inspire much of the other lyrics and the music remains high strung and tense throughout, Stewart's voice low and terse. Track 5's instrumental is less tense, featuring lightly picked acoustic guitar and not much more. The song, however, is crushingly sad, honestly one of Shushu's most depressing pieces of music. In three minutes, Stewart, through his words and moanful singing, draws you into the world of a young immigrant girl studying something she doesn't want to and preparing herself for a career she doesn't desire for the sake of her family. And at this point, that seems like an overplayed trope, boring to some degree. But the song manages to capture the moment so well, 
the despair, the pressure and the obligation. The character knowing that if she fucks this up, not only would it affect her, but her family as well. The song's darkest moments are all centered around the girl's parents. They're proud, and that pride has weight. We Nobody owes anything to their parents, uh, technically. Theoretically, we could all just fuck off after high school and never speak to our family again, but things are rarely that simple. Life is never that straightforward. The debt you owe your family is not something that's legally enforced. It's not external. And that's what makes the song's subject matter so tragic. She's doing this to herself. The pressure and expectation is all hers. The injury is self-inflicted. It could be argued that the loneliness and the despair at this point in time is a choice. And that's what hurts most. The music seems to reflect the complexity of the situation with various tones flitting in and out, often sharp, abrasive and overpowering. The final verse juxtaposes feelings of pride and anguish, ending with the student weeping at her desk no doubt reminding herself of what failure would mean for her family as opposed to herself. Ironically, the song Dear God I Hate Myself brings a much needed upswing in the mood. The song's simplistic and instantaneous lyrics are balanced by busy instrumentation. A mix of programmed and hand-performed elements blends together to create a noisy piece of acoustic electronica. This is perhaps the only correct way to present self-loathing. Any other way and all this would seem very melodramatic and unnecessarily bleak. The energy continues onto the next track, Secret Motel, a flurry of analog synth tones and drum machine patterns. The Fabrizio Palombo retaliation is a mess of metaphors relating to sex sin, and pain that I have difficulty deciphering. It precedes the album's most surprising cut, a rendition of the Appalachian folk classic Cumberland Gap. The band plays it pretty straight with very little deviation and in a way it's quite charming. The album's penultimate track, This Too Shall Pass Away, is an uncharacteristically affirmative dance song about not giving up. The lyrics are littered with morbid imagery but the chorus is hopeful and offers a valid piece of advice. The record flows very easily. One could argue that it lacks in certain specific qualities but the good parts are good and the high parts are high. Even now, on re-listen, the parts I didn't like are growing on me. And the band's embrace of high-energy electronics will continue onto the next album in spectacular fashion. If you're wasting your life, say hi. If you are alone tonight, say hi. If you and he should die, say hi. If there's a hole in your head, say hi. If you have a stitch in your wrist, say hi. If you look at the sky, it is black and shreddy. This is how always opens. Hi presents itself as a sort of anthem for misfits and misanthropes. A rally cry for the average Shushu fan, I imagine. On paper, the words come off as sarcasm, but there is sincerity to it. Jamie Stewart clearly has an idea of the sort of people who connect to his music. It's unexpectedly positive and there's no bitterness to any of it. There's a great line that starts the second verse. Your curtain is closed, yet you are still standing behind it. A line that precedes some honestly sharp and dark bits of poetry. If your body is quick and you forego sight in it, that piece of lace in your tongue. The song pays homage to an array of misplaced, misunderstood and troubled individuals. Bulimics, the suicidal, the depressed and the kinda creepy. The uptempo dance beat sounds like something from an LCD sound system record. With Stewart displaying the same talksing mannerisms as James Murphy. It also sets the mood for what may be Shushu's most hopeful album. And I say that knowing that there's a certain amount of salt that goes with that statement. The feelings of solidarity extend onto the next song, Joey's Song. 
a song written to and about Stewart's brother. The song intersperses tense bits of choral singing with more light-hearted 80s-esque synth pop. There are heartfelt moments throughout the track, with Stewart reminding his brother that regardless of how fuck things get, he will always be waiting. It's probably less accurate to label Beauty Town or Honeysuckle as positive songs. Both songs deal with difficult subject matter. Beauty Town deals with regret and bad memories and Honeysuckle with disillusionment. But neither sounds particularly despondent, especially by Shu Shu standards. Honeysuckle is also notable for being the first Shu Shu song whose lyrics are written entirely by somebody other than Stewart. Angela Sue singing is charmingly amateurish and along with the synth-pop instrumental, distracts from the existential sting of the lyrics. I Love Abortion is almost comical in its presentation. The song is an obvious jab at anti-abortionists with Stuart presenting a different take on the subject. Once again, surprisingly, this is a positive song. Stuart sounds unhinged and manic. The music deviates from the previously synth-heavy tones to more industrially tinged textures. Soul wave bass, snappy synths, and tense rhythms. It also marks a change in the album's mood. The next two songs are written by somebody other than Stewart, a troubled band member he eventually had to let go, and they are appropriately dark. The oldness, as the name would suggest, speaks to more or less the same feeling as Honeysuckle. But here the despondency is played up, the performance is fittingly bleak. But the mood does lift again with the songs Gal Mudin and Born to Suffer. Dear God I Hate Myself had Who Knew's theme and always has Factory Girl. Another song about a woman stuck in an awful and inescapable situation. And while the situation described is certainly terrible and very possibly true, it isn't really what makes the song interesting. What's more interesting is Jamie Stewart's self-loathing. Factory Girl is an extension of Stewart's nihilism. The plight of this fictional character eventually accumulates in a physical object, a handbag. Empathy is an active process. Stewart had to choose to envision the world of a woman behind a sewing machine in a South Asian sweatshop. And the choice to do so the choice to actively think and imagine that world speaks more to Stewart's view of the world than it does to the situation itself, or at least the view he chooses to write from. There's not much I can say about Smear the Queen other than that I hated it at first but really like it now. Stewart and Carla Bazulich's voices layer quite strangely, both fragile and cracking. The album ends in distortion, abruptly stopping. The song it ends on is a reference to a song that appears on Women as Lovers. It's not the only reference on the album, the other being Beauty Town, which of course is a callback to Clown Town from Fabulous Muscles. But to put it all in perspective, this is and will continue to be one of my favorite records by the band. It's an album where every track is, at the very least, engaging, and something I return to quite often. I'm going to be honest here, it was around this point that I started getting severe burnout. I was almost 9000 words into the script and had listened to so much Shu Shu that the band became my most listened to artist of all time. No disrespect to any of the band's previous albums, most of which I love very much, but Angel Guts was a breath of fresh air. Like I said, the band's discography up to this point is impressive, but things were starting to repeat. Similar themes, similar instrumentation. Not that I blame the band. Most groups start repeating themselves to some extent by album 5, let alone album fucking 8. Angel Guts' Red Classroom is a sharp left turn. A break from the usual noise pop rock and the sex, drugs and rock and roll lyricism to something more akin to a horror film soundtrack. The instrumentation is harsher and the harmony often deviates towards dissonance. The influence is overwhelmingly post-punk, 
incessant dance grooves, heavy bass and choppy vocal lines. The album's title is taken from a piece of Japanese erotica, a film that deals with themes of sexual objectification, pornography, assault and prostitution. A lot of those same themes show up on this record as well, most notably on the song Black Dick. You could easily make the argument that objectification is the main appeal of pornography, that it's an expression of base desires, and that's a fair argument to make. The point at which objectification crosses into discrimination or dehumanization, however, is unclear. It's the point that at our most primal, our most unsavory, that we objectify. Is that natural? Because I think that statement would be regarded as problematic. Of course, Black Dick, the song, doesn't necessarily pose these questions outright. Instead, it serves as a representation of the thought process behind race-centric pornography. It's simple, to the point, and dirty, while still maintaining a certain playfulness. All this aided by a motory kraut rock beat and buzzing synth bass. Most of the songs in the album are supported by strong synthetic bass lines and electronic beats. The album's first and obvious highlight, Stupid in the Dark, combines both these things in a spectacular way. Stewart sings in a cracked whisper, his voice sounding even more frail against the throbbing electronics. The song's images of violence are displayed alongside more tender appeals to love. Lawrence Lickers plays off more or less the same energy. The song's intention and overall meaning, however, is lost on me. There's too little here to really speculate on. It follows Stupid really well, carrying that same deviant energy over onto Black Dick. New Life Immigration seems to start with what may or may not be a nod to Joy Division, more specifically the song Atmosphere. Whereas the Joy Division song is sung from the perspective of someone explaining their hardship to another in hopes of sympathy or reciprocation, the Shoo Shoo song, interestingly, is sung from the perspective of somebody trying to convince their lover to commit double suicide with them. The narrator's most convincing utterance being, we don't need to live to love. Things take an even darker turn with songs like El Nacho and Adult Friends. Both offer very little in the way of hook or melody, and I suppose there's something to appreciate about that fact too. Songs that are uncompromisingly dark. Bitter Melon stands out between these darker songs. Not that its focus is any less depraved. In that sense, it fits in with the rest of the track list. The drum machine beat that the song is built upon seems inappropriate for the subject matter. The rhythm's playfulness seems gleefully out of place in a song that is almost certainly sung from the perspective of a pedophile, or at least somebody entertaining sexual thoughts involving minors. I'm not going to say I like Angel Gut's Red Classroom all the way through. That's despite being one of the band's most cohesive albums. The themes are clear both musically and lyrically, and it's not even that I dislike the themes all that much. They just don't tug at me as strongly as they do on previous albums. The numeral year would be 6. It's an interesting, at points compelling album that I wouldn't recommend to first time listeners, or even to second time listeners, but it is something I would certainly recommend. At first glance, it may seem odd that the band would choose to cover the music of Twin Peaks. It's a left turn in their track list for sure, but it also makes complete sense. The band loves doing covers and it was just a matter of time before they committed to doing a longer, grander project. But still, I don't think anybody expected this one. Shushu's twisted and volatile nature weaves well with that of Twin Peaks. They play a lot of the instrumental songs fairly straight, like their reinterpretation of Aubrey's dance turning into a slightly twisted, slightly creepy piece of lounge music. I wasn't that big a fan of the originals, so the interpretation didn't really compel me all that much. But I'm a lot more impressed by the band's interpretation of Blue Frank slash Pink Room, which they twist into a noisy, bluesy, stoner rock song with some of Stewart's most interesting guitar playing. 
There's something about it that feels very King Crimson-esque, very old school prog. Sycamore Tree is one of the few songs with singing. Stewart's voice is warbled and distorted. His voice bends and contorts in ways I wasn't sure it could. The singing with solo piano accompaniments at points reminds me of Nina Simone, with Stewart evoking that same sense of drama. He manages to pull something out of the song that wasn't there before, something that the original composers might not have intended to add. What we get is a haunting piece of blues, a piece that feels lonely and that conjures feelings of despair and fear. The record's strongest aspect by far is its dedication to drawing out the darker themes present in the music of Twin Peaks. It's an album I'd say is as dark as Angel Guts, but presents the darkness in a more nuanced way. I actually prefer this album's performance of Dance of the Dream Man. The smokier, hazier atmosphere sounds richer than the originals. The more abrasive textures also lend a certain realness to it that I think was missing from the original soundtrack version. Like many people, I've always had a fondness for the song Falling, and the band's cover does it justice. The song is a beautiful composition and Shushu honor that, preserving the climax and presenting it with the intensity that it deserves. The song love theme Farewell becomes a darker, more pensive song, leading into the final track of the record rather well. Josie's past, made up of a spoken word piece taken from Laura Palmer's diary set to music, is honestly one of the most unsettling things Shushu have ever recorded. Shayna Dunkelman's delivery is somehow both innocent and tortured. Obviously a lot of credit goes to David Lynch for writing the monologue in the first place, but Shushu framed the words with music that highlight the deep sadness, the shame and the unsettling nature of the piece. Stewart makes one last appearance, quoting from an old novelty song. Hearing the song for the first time is honestly a terrifying experience. Stewart appears seemingly out of nowhere and almost literally howls. There's no beauty here. The song commits to being dark and frightful. It never deviates and doesn't compromise. To put it plainly, it's fucked up, is what it is, and the fact that it evokes that sort of reaction is entirely why it's great. It's interesting that the band's darkest albums follow one another back to back. Both are concept albums and both embrace themes of violence and sexual depravity. Where this album wins out is how it balances those dark themes with softer bits in between. It plays with contrast more effectively, making the more depressing, demented moments feel even worse. Believe it or not, for a long time this was actually my favorite Shushu album. That may no longer be the case, but it's still special to me. There's this interesting mix of nostalgia and wonderment that this album evokes and it's one of the few pieces of music that I would consider genuinely frightening. I'm actually not a fan of how this album starts. The bombastic spoken word piece seems out of place, mainly because what follows has a certain subtleness to it, a subtleness that seems almost antithetical to the band and Stewart's sensibilities up to this point. He's done soft and sad before, however this feels different. The album is bright in parts and there's still a healthy amount of feedback and distortion, but the abrasive edges appear to be sanded down, and it's certainly more traditional in its approach to songwriting. Even if there are moments on this record I do not particularly like, they're very easily and very quickly overshadowed by the brilliant ones. The synth-pop throwback Wandering is the first standout on the album with its throbbing electronics and layered sing-song choruses. The harrowing synth lines and the off-kilter groove vocals, however, pull it back into that nightmarishly pretty territory that Shushu so comfortably occupy. But like I mentioned, the album really shines in its subtler moments. Stewart's voice takes on a peculiar character in the song Get Up. It's stripped almost entirely of intonation. It seems almost emotionless. 
possibly pointing to feelings of dejection. And it's in this voice that Stewart delivers the album's darkest line. During the rape of everything decent The flickering flames impressed me it continues in this direction on the song Hey Choco Banana. Angela Sue's voice shows up in a lot of the record's best moments. Her ghostly moans during the chorus of Hey Choco Banana are my favorite part of the song. The floaty chorus somehow sits nicely against the heavy distorted bass that shows up midway through the track, everything culminating in a flurry of dissonance and feedback. <laughs> Jenny Gogo sees Stewart reciting a series of oxymoronic statements over a slow plodding electro pop instrumental. The final moments of the song are blissfully busy. Square waves and sharp metallic percussion bring the song to a tense close. A tension that carries into the two songs that follow. The better of those two, At Last, At Last, revisits the subtle electronica of songs like Wandering. The song seems to describe relief. Relief that follows an anticipated moment of pain. The feeling that what happened, however cold or terrible, is finally over. I wondered for a long time why it took me this long to really grasp this record. Forget is the quietest Shushu album. It's still abrasive and loud at points, but it's an album best heard in the moment. The moment after things have come undone. It's a grief record. Something I think is perfectly encompassed by the second last song, Petite. There's a particularly moving moment in the song when the cello enters. Its movement seemingly twisted and misshapen. And Stewart's voice, clearly pained, sings the chorus. The song is a dedication to sex work, specifically underage sex trafficking. Stewart makes an interesting choice. In giving voice to these women and channeling their perspective, he chooses a deity, a god, and he makes the god feminine. It was oh, not my aim to be a slave. What God wants, she does. Touches of blood and murders of fools but God wants she does I don't know what the larger commentary is. In a way it may just be a purposeful juxtaposition to the reality of the situation. These women who exist beyond the song as real people whose daily lives are probably, for the most part, unadulterated suffering, work as sex slaves to please mostly male clientele. In some way, then, it makes sense for this mythical figure, this godhead, this murderer of fools, to be something beyond what they know. They know men in all their violence and their physicality. Would it then not make sense for their deity to be different? The final track appears to borrow its tone and themes from Angel Gut's Red Classroom. It's similarly drone-heavy and abstract. It also stands in complete contrast to the first track. Like track 1, there's a guest appearance on this one too, this time from Vaginal Davis, an early drag icon who I knew nothing about until this album. Continuing the contrast, her piece is a heady spoken word poem that plays out to the end of the song. The poem's theme seems to center on femininity, and I have no insight beyond that. But it caps off one of the band's best albums, possibly the best in their later era. It's not the type of album that'll wave its hands at you to get your attention. It's the quiet, mild-mannered patron in the back of the bar, the one who, despite their overall makeup, is most likely the most engaging person there. Take a break! The pressure rips are apart! Girl with Basket of Fruit eschews any and all modesty. The album is unapologetic and at points alienating. The album resembles Angel Guts' Red Classroom in a lot of ways. But where Angel Guts only went kinda hard, 
Go with Basket of Fruit Team's intent on going all the way. There's a lot less pop here and a whole lot more noise. It's an album that will keep you at arm's length for as long as it possibly can. There are glimpses of melody and familiar club rhythms, but the majority of the music is twisted and unwieldy. Things flow in unnatural ways and structure seems non-existent and the mood is constantly tense. Listening to this album in a crowded and busy supermarket is a good way to make yourself very uncomfortable very quickly. There's a really interesting and revealing article written by Stewart where he offers insight into a lot of the inspiration behind the record's themes. It's worth reading if only for the book recommendations. But as suggested by the title, a lot of the record's ideas are female focused. The title itself alludes to the painting Boy with Basket of Fruit. In the article, Stewart says, and I quote, It is perilous to be a girl. Look at almost any painting of girls from this era and it feels tense. As tense as it is now and as tense as it remains. Fuck this world. The band has a history of documenting feminine struggles. A lot of their most compelling songs are about women or written from the perspective of women. But the meanings here aren't all that obvious. There are quite a few layers here with a lot of very niche and difficult to decipher allusions. There are references to demonic or Gnostic figures in quite a few songs. It's an album painted in darkness, a record I'm still trying to come to terms with. This album sounds as much like Scott Walker as it does late era Miles Davis. It's an odd and honestly impressive mix of genres and styles. The midsection is by far the most compelling part of the album. The music skews more traditional in this section, featuring a lot of synths and sequenced drum beats. The elements are familiar, but Stewart's words are even more veiled than before. There's a strange and almost mystical quality to a lot of them. For example, the final moments of the song, The Wrong Thing. Cynthia on the throne Oh, cubes and squares go home The airy synths and tender vocal performances from Stewart and Angela Sue are reminiscent of the stuff they were doing on the Twin Peaks album. On an album defined by excess, songs like The Wrong Thing stand out in how subtle they choose to be. The temptation with an album like this is to try and understand it, to decipher every little piece. But I would argue this album is best just experienced. There are obvious layers and room for deeper thought, but the album's strongest qualities are surface level. It taps into something primal. At its core, I believe Girl With Basket Of Fruit is just a twisted dance record. There's clearly still a dedication and admiration for rhythm. Even on more abstract songs like it comes out as a joke, Stewart and co include steady rhythms, while providing this illusion of messiness. Pumpkin Attack on Mommy and Daddy is the most obvious example of this, with its techno-influenced drum rhythms and chopped vocals. I think it's the most fully realized version of the sound the album is going for. Stewart's voice is mostly absent from the song. What we have is Angela Sue. The lyrics make multiple references to animals, pigs mostly, and also a Korean folk story involving a bear and a tiger. Stewart does note that many of Angela Sue's lyrics were improvised while she was drunk, and a lot of them come out as unintentionally sweet and funny. The record ends on a soft note, a song featuring Oxbow frontman Eugene S. Robinson and made up entirely of electric piano and double bass. The relationship described by Stewart and Robinson is very clearly unhealthy. I don't need it to be fair. I think I've shown you. I don't need you to be kind. Just let me pretend. There's an interesting and moving contrast between Stewart's melancholy and Robinson's anguish. It's a strange and welcome way to end the album. If I had to sum up my thoughts about Girl With Basket of Fruit, I'd have to make it clear that there's a lot I like about the album. 
I think it's an oddity in the catalog of a band that seems to reject any amount of normalcy. It's impressive that the band would choose to deviate this much this deeply into their career. At the very least, it's an interesting experience. Maybe not as enjoyable of an experience as listening to something like Forget, but enjoyable nonetheless. I am so... I don't need it to be fair. Okay, so this album came out just as I was finishing this script. I'm not going to say much about it because honestly I've yet to really make up my mind about how I feel. The album's conceit is that it's a record of duets. Each track features a different guest. It's an interesting idea and makes each track feel, to some extent, unique. It also means the album doesn't feel as cohesive as the other records in the band's catalogue. There are highlights, however. Like the band's cover of 100 years. They really play up the dark wave aesthetics to the point that Chelsea Wolf seems more or less at home. A song that wouldn't seem totally out of place on Girl with Basket of Fruit. The mood overall tends towards melancholy. It's not as crushingly depressing as some of their other work, but there's a general malaise that hangs over it. I think I like this album. It's just hard to say. It's not offensive when it's on, and the more I listen to it, the more I discover how much I like it. I feel a certain obligation to talk about the track featuring Liz Harris. It's not the most spectacular thing I've heard, but I do like it. Harris's vocals are reverbed and appropriately spectral. The track is actually one of the album's happier songs. But I suspect I'll grow to love this album as time goes on. I mean, it's Shoo Shoo. At this point, I'm more or less predisposed to liking anything they do. I started writing this script about a year ago, and I'm acutely aware that the person I was when I started writing this is different from the person I am now. In the last few months, I've graduated, gotten a job, and been forced to grow up in ways I didn't expect. And a significant amount of the music I listened to while this was happening was Shoo Shoo. When I started listening to Shoo Shoo, I remember being taken aback by how dark all of it was. I used to not listen to A Promise just because I knew it would put me in a mood. I think some of it frightened me because it seemed so foreign, so adult. Like these were real people problems. Maybe not 100% applicable to everybody, but the overall message seemed clear. Sometimes life just fucking sucks without any proper reason or satisfying explanation as to why. There are people born into hell who will, unfortunately, die there too. There's a Stuart quote I brought up earlier where he's talking about the songs he wanted to write. Songs that very specifically narrate some particularly horrible things that happen to people with no positive resolution to it at all. It's hard for me to fully understand why music that seems so decidedly nihilistic would seem so appealing during the most hopeful and happy periods of my life. Regardless, it's what I needed in that moment. I guess I just needed to be reminded that things could turn out badly, that there's no such thing as guaranteed happiness. And this isn't just sad music, it's not just emo. Those things feel removed from the situation. There are added layers to that sort of thing. But with Shoo Shoo, things tend to feel stark and real. Their art is cold and harsh and forgoes the listener's need for comfort. And I don't know why that appeals to me. There's a lot of Chinese theatre percussion in Shoo Shoo's music. And for anybody that's seen a traditional Chinese theatre performance, you'll know that the percussion is often chaotic and seemingly devoid of rhythm. It's hard to call that music because it's often not used as music. It's crafted noise. Beautiful devastation used to indicate moments of tension and anxiety. Which seems like a good way to describe Shu Shu's music overall. It's not for everybody. I don't listen to Shu Shu because I want to feel sad or anxious. I listen to it because it soothes me. And I suspect I'm not the only one that feels that way. Because let's face it. 
Sometimes life fucking sucks and pretending like it doesn't seems like the worst way to deal with it.